So, uh, I, ha I host a podcast called The Slash Filmcast, uh, which is a film podcast. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Listeners. Um, and uh, Stephen Tobolowsky was a guest, and his stories were incredible. Like, he would, he would just, I mean, hopefully you can tell, even just now in the Q&A, like, when he starts talking, you just are absorbed, and there's usually some kind of lesson at the end of it. So, uh, we had him on the podcast, great fun, uh, and we had him on the podcast a few times, and then... Like a year and a half after the first appearance in the podcast, I said to him, Stephen, your stories are so good. I, I bet there's so many more stories up in here, and if we don't preserve them in some way, they'll just be lost forever. Like, we'll just never get the benefit of those stories. Um, so let me know if you'd like to preserve those stories somehow. I think Stephen's motto is, uh, good things happen when you say yes, which is borne out by his filmography, uh, mostly. Uh, and so, you know... Uh, he does this because he loves me. <laughs> yeah, he, so he said yes, and we started recording the podcast, and it led to a book, and then a colleague of mine uh, said to me that, like, on Facebook, uh, Tony Zhu, the great video essayist, he said, 50 times the number of people will watch something than will listen to something. Like, if you have, like, a video, it doesn't matter, like, what it is, people will watch it more than they'll listen to it. And, you know, we have a podcast of the Tobolowsky Files, 70 episodes of, like, one hour each audio, but it's, like... More people will watch this than will listen to that podcast. And so this, video, this uh, movie was a way of, of uh, trying to bring Stephen's storytelling to a wider audience. So the question is about how did Stephen tweak his um, writing style to you know, adapt to the film and about how I conceived of it as well. So uh, I learned a lot through David with the podcast and that I learned that when, you, when we do the podcast, time operates at a certain speed and I could kind of jawbone and we could goof off and the audience will still kind of follow it. Uh, when you tell a story, when I start telling the story in the podcast, time is foreshortened. And the audience gets ahead of the story much quicker. When I transferred some of those stories to the written word in Dangerous Animals Club, I realized time is even shorter that the audience gets so far ahead of the written word because an audience is smart. What do you, what do you mean when you say it gets so far ahead of it? You've, you've explained this before. It's been... Yeah. Uh, an audience, as soon as you say to an audience, I want to tell you a story about my mother. An audience will know the instant they hear the word mother and the intonation I say mother, they already know the tone and temperament and style of the entire story. It doesn't have to be belabored. Now, you can use that to surprise them, like I tried to do with the Ben Franklin story. Like, <coughs> Mom, you know, you try to set the audience up to think it's going to be something that tugs at the heartstrings, just to make them feel like the way I felt. But I realized, filming it live, like this, it's not as foreshortened as writing, but it's it has a visual element that the podcast <laughs> yeah. does not have. Yeah. That moment right there, in which I didn't say anything. Nobody was bored. Because visually, thought is theatrical. And it's something actors forget when they act. And so, it enabled me to know that keep the story moving as fast as possible, but if I have to think, not to panic, like when I'm on stage talking for an hour and a half, because that was just half of the show. I did a whole other story after that. But it was too much for an audience to con I realize it's a lot of concentration for an audience to do this, because there are no wide shots to just relax in. Uh, it, it, as long as you're thinking, it gives the audience room to breathe too. So it, that affected the uh, writing process. Yeah. And in terms of like what the final form of the film was, this was originally supposed to be a more conventional documentary of the kind that m many of which play at awesome festivals like IFF Boston, where it's like we mixed a ton of footage together and there's like shots of him on stage and you know him telling the story to the camera and you know backstage and interviews and it was supposed to be all those things and be like a conventional documentary. Um, but we ended up like looking at all, we, we shot 
many, many, many hours of footage, like dozens of hours of footage, and we ended up like looking at all the footage, and we're like, of all the footage we have, like what is the best thing that we could assemble from this? We could, we could make a conventional documentary, but it wouldn't have been as good of a concert film as that film was a concert film. Like it wouldn't have been, like the, you know, the, the level of quality of concert film that was would not have been the level of quality of documentary that we would have ended up having. So we ended up going with uh, just a straight up concert film. And so that's, um, you know, it was, and it was a painful process. Like we tried many different iterations and we're like, you know, we know that that is gonna work. Like we know for a fact that this is gonna work, so. Um, so that's kind of how the, the film evolved.